If you took a look at the entire original Autobot toy lineup introduced to us in 1984 and was asked to pick out who you thought was the hands-down physically strongest of the bunch, aside from Prime, of course, chances are pretty good that you would pick the wrong one. I mean, who in their right mind would think that this guy would turn out to be quite the hunk? The original Transformers toy line was well known for having many toys that looked nothing like their cartoon counterparts. But for me, probably one of the biggest offender in that regard was the minibot demolition expert, Braun. I truly wonder what was going through writer Bob Budiansky's head when he picked up that original microchange toy that would eventually become Braun and make him think that he was holding the strong guy of the team. Maybe it was the fact that he transformed into a rugged off-road vehicle. Or maybe it was his tough-looking bullet-shaped helmeted head. Who knows? But rugged vehicle and bullet head shape aside, all that you were left with was a small and slim robot that looked like he was standing on wooden planks or stilts for legs and who had really, really, really scrawny and puny arms. They didn't even have fingers, just upward-facing hooks. I'll tell you one thing, the word brawn would be the last word to enter my head. Actually, maybe he meant to call him brown, since that was sort of the color of the original pre-Transformers toy. And speaking of the original pre-Transformers toy, I do think it's worth mentioning that unlike most of his fellow Wave 1ers, the actual toys that would eventually end up turning into Brawn and fellow Minibots, Huffer, Gears, and Windcharger, were originally designed by an American toy company called Knickerbocker for their line called Mysterians, which is what the letter M that is found sculpted on Brawn and Gears hoods, as well as Huffer's sides, could have stood for. But ultimately, plans for the Mysterians were scrapped when Hasbro acquired Knickerbocker before any actual toys could see the light of day. And so, the first official toys would make their debut as part of Takara's microchange line. No need to scrap the M. And the rest is history. Anyway, the original six minibots were definitely a mixed bag. Of course, leading the way you had Bumblebee, who was the breakout character because he was the most relatable of the bunch. Cliff Jumper was entertaining in the sense that he was kind of delusional into thinking that he was so great and often bit off more than he could chew. Gears and Huffer were the grump and the whiner, respectively, who both hated the Earth and just wanted to go back to Cybertron. And Windcharger, well, I guess you could say he had a uh, magnetic personality. Okay, so he was basically kind of lost in the background. And then you had Braun, who was surprisingly, despite his small size, one of the toughest and strongest members of the entire team. It was this little twist in his character that made him one of my instant favorites. I mean, who wouldn't like a little bot who could literally lay the smack down on the bigger ones? And it was probably the reason why he was one of the more used characters in the first two seasons of the G1 cartoon. While rarely being the focal point of any episode, Braun was constantly making his presence felt by doing some cool action bit or nothing at all, like standing like a wall for a flying cliff jumper to bounce off of. Braun has beaten up a couple of Seekers like they were nothing, literally walked through doors, used the Decepticon Soundwave as his own personal flying horse, enacted his own version of the Fastball Special with Prime to take down the Insecticon Shrapnel, and actually not just survived a direct blast to the chest from Megatron's Fusion Cannon, but also managed to commandeer said Fusion Cannon and give Megatron a taste of his own medicine. But for me, Braun's most famous scene was the one that truly established him as the strong guy of the team. During a major battle with the Decepticons, Braun played a pivotal role by literally throwing a charging Optimus Prime truck at Starscream in order to disarm him and ultimately win the battle. It's awesome scenes like these that instantly won him brawny points from me. Braun did feature though in one episode wherein he, Bumblebee, and the Autobot scientist Perceptor were shrunken down to teeny tiny microbot size in order to enter Megatron's body and deactivate his newly found power source, the heart of Cybertron. While taking down Megatron was the main plot of the episode, the side story revolved around Braun's relationship with Perceptor, whom he originally looked down on for being what he considered a weak intellectual and a coward. 
But Perceptor's idea of microscopic infiltration, which ultimately led to victory, mightily impressed Braun, and at the end of the day, he immediately changed his tune and declared Perceptor a hero and his buddy. Anyway, as for any other cartoon series after the original, even if they were not the same character per se, I thought that it would be worth mentioning the character x Braun from the 2001 series Robots in Disguise. I'll be honest, I never watched this show, but I do know enough to see the similarities in both Transformers being gruff and tough characters. Oh, and for the record, the X was not added to Braun's name for trademark reasons. It was simply there because the writers thought it sounded cooler. A more direct evolution of the original Braun, though, was featured in a later series, Transformers Animated in 2007. This was more of a one-off appearance for Braun, doing what Braun does best, picking up huge cuts of rock and chucking them at the enemy. As part of Team Athena, led by Rodimus, the little powerhouse tried but eventually failed to defend a space bridge from a Decepticon takeover. And while Braun wasn't a part of the awesome series that followed animated in Transformers Prime, a toy of the main Autobot bruiser Bulkhead was later used to make this interesting version in Japan as part of their 2014 Cloud series, wherein the original Braun is upgraded into this new Hulk-top form complete with his special maze called Bang the Gong, which was most likely a callback to Braun's original Japanese name, Gong. So let's get it on. In the comics, it was also really more of the same with Braun, not really featured much as a central character, but still managing to find opportunities to shine in his own brawny way. While the majority of his time in the original Marvel comics was spent being deactivated, repaired, deactivated, repaired, and eventually vaporized, Braun did feature in a little story arc in the UK Transformers title, whose stories took place in between the issues of the main US series. In The Enemy Within, while doing some repair work on board the Ark, Braun is the unfortunate recipient of some intense electronic feedback, which basically scrambles up his brain. Braun goes crazy, beats up some Autobots with those hook arms that kind of don't look so puny now, and goes out on his own to wage war against humans to free his fellow cars from slavery, whom he also then proceeds to destroy for being ungrateful and not running off to freedom. In the end, he is taken down by his fellow Autobots and repaired, and all is good once again, that is, until his next deactivation. In the short-lived Dreamwave comics, Braun and Ratchet take on the Decepticon combiner Bruticus. And while they fail to take the giant down, Braun has his moment to shine wherein he dons his battle mask, a nice callback to the original toy, and does what he does best, chucks a huge slab of rock right into the combiner's face. In the IDW universe, while a good number of second and third string characters were given massive personality overhauls, turning them into fan favorites, Braun unfortunately remained as the perennial background character who had one memorable scene wherein he kicks the crap out of Starscream and rescues my favorite Decepticon turned screenwriter Thundercracker from certain death. So, thanks Braun. And finally, in the really oddball one-off miniseries The Transformers vs. G.I. Joe, also by IDW, Braun actually ends up winning the heart of the G.I. Joe supermodel tank driver, Covergirl, and they get married. And through the miracle of binary bond, headmaster, and techno-active core technology, they have a kid. No, seriously, that happened. Oh, and guess who the godparent was? Why, his old buddy, Perceptor. So anyway, while I got your thoughts in motion over the house of the creation of the very first cyber-human child, let's take a quick break as I'd like to invite you all to give being a member of my channel a shot. If you regularly enjoy the stories that I put out weekly, I'd like to give you more, like early access to my videos and exclusive ones as well. I'd also like to connect with all of you more through social media and scheduled chat sessions wherein you can help figure out what new stories can be told on my channel. How cool is that? Yes, I know all of this will cost you a teeny tiny bit, but I remain committed to making sure that it'll be all worth it for you. But if you're not keen on joining right now or ever, that's perfectly fine. Your continued viewership and support is more than enough, so thank you. Now back to Braun. As a kid, I remember having a knockoff version of the original Braun toy, and it really didn't do much for me. Because he was so radically different from the cartoon character that I had grown to love, I longed for a proper looking Braun toy. And it pretty much became an obsession for me, as it would take quite a few years for us to finally get one. 
The first modern Braun toy that I remember getting would be in 2008 when a Legends version of the guy was released. While this Braun was definitely an improvement from the original toy, I mean, he actually had arms this time around. He was far from the Braun that I was hoping for. Since he was legend scale, he was tiny and his articulation was definitely limited. One year later, Hasbro released a movie version of Braun. Since he never actually came out in the movies, this figure was more of an homage to the original G1 character. Of course, like almost all movie characters, homage or not, this guy looked nothing like the minibot Braun. He only sported a similar color scheme and vehicle mode. Regardless, I did think that this toy design was really cool and he has remained a favorite of mine to this day. Then in 2012, third-party company iGear gave me hope with their shot at a proper brawn called Hench. For what he was, he served the purpose of a default brawn on my toy shelf. He had a pretty unique transformation wherein the sides of his car would fold into each other, forming a less stilt-like and more solid leg, and which would serve as the blueprint for many better versions of brawn later on down the line. Unfortunately, he was too big to fit in with my Chug Transformer shelf, and while you could kind of fudge it for a masterpiece transformer size-wise, he looked too simple in design to fully fit in. Eventually, I decided to go separate ways with the guy when better versions inevitably were released. Then, in 2016, Hasbro got everyone excited when they announced that they would be releasing a new Braun in their Titan's Return toy line. Unfortunately, much to the disappointment of Braun fans everywhere, it would just be a Titan Master, meaning instead of an actual Braun figure, all we got was a tiny robot that transformed into Braun's head that could be then plugged into other Transformer characters. Luckily, Hasbro wasn't quite done with Braun. Less than a year later, they released an even newer toy of Braun, and this time, they did it right by giving us a full figure. This newer version of Braun was just the figure we needed as it was sized just right to fit in with our Chug collection and had good enough articulation and he looked just like the cartoon. No more scrawny arms here. One interesting bit was that he was also compatible with the Tiny Titan's Return Headmaster as the little robot could fit inside the new Braun's vehicle mode. Oh, and I just recently learned that in Japan, there was an actual explanation for the existence of these two brawns, wherein the Titan Master was the actual brawn subjected to downsizing due to being exposed to energies resulting from battling Decepticons near a black hole. And so the next brawn toy was actually a body constructed by the Titan Master to pilot. Anyway, despite that odd arrangement, both Titans Return brawns served their purpose for a long time on my shelf. Until they didn't, but we'll get back to that in a bit, as I'd like to momentarily jump over to the masterpiece scale. As I said, try as best as he might, Hench just didn't pass himself off as a viable masterpiece option for me. It would be years later until third-party company, Bad Ube, just kidding, just kidding, Bad Cube, would finally give us the first decent masterpiece brawn in their offering called Brawny. At the time of its original release though, I was still skeptical over non-official Masterpiece products. So I passed, a move I ended up regretting since when I finally got over my hesitation over non-official Transformers, Brawny had already sold out and was going for insane prices on the secondary market. Luckily, Bad Cube decided to reissue Brawny in 2017, and this time around, I didn't hesitate. And for what he was, Brawny truly was a cool toy, and to this day is still a serviceable masterpiece option in my opinion. Brawny's appearance left no doubt in anybody's mind that this was one strong bot. But in my opinion, I think he just did it a little bit too much, as ultimately, I found his proportions a bit too… wide. Which was made even more obvious when my favorite third-party company, Fans Toys, announced their brawn called Hunk in 2018 and released him a couple years later. I immediately knew that my long journey to find my ultimate brawn had finally ended. Yes, sure, Hunk is not a perfect toy. I mean, what is? But for my money, he pretty much encapsulates everything that I wanted in a masterpiece brawn. Okay, so maybe I find him a little bit too tall, but whatever. Hunk is it for my masterpiece shelf. So with that out of the way, let's go back to the Chug scale wherein Hasbro gave a couple more recent brawns. The first was another live action version based on his blink and you'll miss it appearance in the first 5 minutes of 2018's Bumblebee movie, which was sort of a very soft reboot 
of the previous Bayverse movies. And as such, this brawn was a lot closer in design to the original G1 character. Just a little rounder. He even sported a drill accessory which the OG brawn often used in the cartoon. But in my opinion, the most relevant brawn toy for now would be the one that was just recently released last year. After pretty much finishing off a decent Scout class sized lineup of the original six minibots, Hasbro did what any money centered making company would do have completist collectors like myself rebuy the same characters by offering arguably better versions of them. In this case, they reset the minibot scale by giving us a deluxe sized cliff jumper in 2020's Earthrise line, thus making our older and more notably smaller minibots look out of place. And very soon, the rest of the larger scaled minibots followed with B, Huffer, and finally Braun getting the deluxe treatment in 2023. Gears followed soon after, and we are still waiting for Wind Charger Hasbro. Just saying. But moving on, this Braun was part of the Studio Series 86 line, which featured more screen accurate renditions of the Transformers featured in the 1986 animated movie. And despite only appearing for a few seconds before he is killed off by the Decepticons, the first casualty of the movie, it was enough to earn Braun a brand new, much improved figure, which I guess makes it a good thing? Oh yeah, Hasbro quickly followed this up with a dead Braun redeco of this toy. So, yay? Anyway, I belong to a number of fans who believe that Braun didn't die in the 86 movie. I mean, come on! This guy was one of the toughest Autobots period, who as I mentioned earlier, took a direct shot from Megatron's fusion cannon and jumped right back into action as if it was nothing. And you're telling me that a single shot to the shoulder would make him do his best Maroc impression and take him down for good? Nah, I'm not buying it. I mean, in an episode after the movie wherein a group of Autobots find shelter in a space mausoleum, the crypts of fellow ill-fated crewmates Ironhide, Ratchet, and Prowl are clearly shown or at least called out, but no mention of Braun. And he was spotted as a background character in another post-movie episode, along with his fellow buds Huffer and… Bone Crusher? Oh well. I guess it's all wishful thinking. Apparently, in early drafts of the movie, it is stated that Braun is graphically sliced in half from a blast from Megatron. A definitely more believable way to go. Anyway, regardless of his inglorious demise in the movie, Braun continues to live on in all his plastic glory on my toy shelf, and that's good enough for me. And while it is nice to think that he actually did survive, here's one crewmate that definitely didn't. Such heroic nonsense. Check out his story here. Or if you want other Transformers stories, check out this playlist over here. Either way, thanks for watching and I hope you come back for more.